Our next discussion in the Trends in Asset Management Conference will focus on the role of venture capital funds in spurring sustainable innovation. Moderating this discussion will be Brandeis International Business School's own Debarshi Nandi. Debarshi is the Barbara and Richard M. Rosenberg Professor of Global Finance, the Director of our Master of Science in Finance program, and the co-director of the Rosenberg Institute of Global Finance, in addition to a member of our Asset Management Council. Debarshi will be joined by panelists Tansil Ismail, Jane Cairns, Josh Lerner, and Laura Lindsay. Tansel is a vice president at Energy Impact Partners. Jane is partner at Evoke Innovations. Joss is the J Jacob H. Schiff Professor of Investment Banking at Harvard Business School. And Laura is in the Department of Finance, is the Department of Finance Chair and the Cutler Family Endowed Professor at Arizona State University's W.P. Carey School of Business. Debarshi, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, uh, for the introductions. And um, if I may quickly add, uh, welcome to um, Josh, Jane, Laura, and Tansel. Um, great to have you here. Um, as um, Dean Grady mentioned, um, you know, Tansel is at uh, Energy Impact Partners, which is a multi stage venture capital firm. Uh, with about 2 billion AUM under management and focuses on uh, conservation in the energy industry um, and towards decarbonization and uh, an electrified future. Uh, Jane is a partner at Evoc Innovations uh, and uh, she is a leader with uh, great decades of experience in clean technology, sustainability and venture capital. And she herself has co-founded and exited a renewable energy company as well. Um, Professor Josh Lerner is, um, has been the champion for venture capital uh, innovation, entrepreneurship research in academia globally. And uh, for many of us in academia and certainly personally for me also, his extensive research has uh, you know, inspired us to kind of uh, get attracted and look into different issues in this area. So. Uh, welcome, Josh. Great to have all of you here. Laura is um, the, as uh, you know, Dean Grady mentioned, she's the chair of the department and also the Cutler Family Endowed Professor at uh, Arizona State University. In addition to her interests in entrepreneurial finance, venture capital, and private equity, Laura also has a lot of in, uh, research interest in um, governance, firm governance in ESG in particular, and uh, also on the boundaries of firms and in financial contracting. Welcome everyone, welcome Laura, great to have you here. So um, we are going to start off with a presentation from Josh um, who will uh, tell us about the big challenges and opportunities uh, in um, the venture capital uh, space as it relates to sustainability and clean energy. Josh, over to you. Well, th thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. And to uh, uh, and I'm going to share my slides. Uh, a little uh, anxiety ridden here in terms of the technology, but you know, such is the nature of uh, the Zoom era. I think we're just going to live with uh, live with this and not try to push it any further lest the good be the enemy of a good be the enemy of a great, which is usually the case in most of my Zoom exp teaching expeditions. You just do a little more adjustment and then things go completely haywire. So um, let me just, you know, sort of frame the discussion we're going to have here with a couple of things. The first, as Debarsh promised, is that I am an enthusiast for venture capital. And I think what we're going to show to start off with is just how influential venture capital really is. So that essentially, and keeping this in context, you know, essentially in a typical year in the United States, less than one half of 1% of companies receive venture capital for uh, at any given time. But as we'll see, the impact of venture capital is huge. And much of that impact seems to be causal, not just simply accidental. But at the same time, I don't, I think, it's possible to overstate things and sort of view venture as a cure-all. And in particular, I'll highlight some of the sort of potential limitations that are there 
that we need to be aware of uh, as, 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 as well. So one way to sort of start is to sort of begin by just thinking about that one half of 1% number and contrast it with the share of companies that have gone public. This essentially looks at companies which went public, which are, uh, which went public between 95 and 2019, and then takes a snapshot of those companies, the ones which survived to the end of 2019. And it highlights that essentially from that one half of 1%, essentially half the companies are ones that ended up uh, being the venture back. So these are incredibly likely to be successful as companies. And particularly striking is when you look at the statistics in terms of young companies, you see things like 70% of the public market capitalization of young companies is that subset of venture-backed companies. Even more striking, if you look at R&D by being done by young companies, almost 90% of the R&D that's being done is essentially being done by uh, the venture-backed subset of those young companies. So hugely influential in terms of the uh, kind of consequences it has for uh, innovation in the United States. We can see this in a bunch of other ways. One way is to simply just simply contrast the patents of companies that are backed by venture capital with the ones that aren't backed by venture capital. Uh, and essentially, when you look at citations, which is often an indication of importance, you know, you see they're almost five times more likely to be in the top 1%, close to the intellectual frontier, and it's close to science, various measures of path breaking, you see very much uh, you have this kind of sense that not only is there more innovation taking place, but it's really important innovation that's taking place. So an increase in both inputs and outputs. Moreover, it seems to be a causal relationship. It's not just simply that the venture capitalists are showing up at the right place and giving money to companies that would have been successful anyway. So one fascinating study that was done by uh, my uh, colleague Shai Bernstein, along with uh, 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 a couple of co-authors, Rick Townsend and Xavier Giraud, we looked at essentially situations where you had a venture capitalist who had already funded a company in another city, but where there wasn't a direct flight between uh, where the venture capitalist was located and that city. And the addition of the direct flight basically meant the venture capitalist ended up coming spending more time with those companies. Presumably they don't like to change planes any more than we do. Uh, and um, it basically turned out that the companies as a result were more innovative and were more likely to be successful like going public. So again, it's sort of consistent with this notion that it's not just simply you know, some selection story, but it's really hands-on value added in terms of the process that's there. At the same time, we know there are concerns. So. There's good Peter and bad Peter. Here's good Peter saying, making the point that uh, you know venture capitalists didn't fund uh, didn't fund a lot of stuff that they should have funded, and you can see it in the data. So here's some compilation that my colleague Ramanananda did of looking at basically what was the funding in 2010 and 2019 of venture capital. I mean, one thing we see is there was a lot more in 19 than in 10. If we look at the bottom line, energy, materials, and, res and resources, right? That's the red. That's not really budged, right? Um, the yellow, the hardware, that's not really budged very much at all. Where's all the growth been? It's been in the IT services, you know, the web-enabled consumer products and services and business products and services, right? That there's been this sort of tremendous growth there and that this sort of corroborates in some sense the, 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 teal, uh, the teal critique. And I'm sure when the panelists join, they'll talk a little bit about some of the changes that have happened subsequently, uh, both for better and for uh, a better and for worse. In some sense, this is not completely irrational on the part of venture capitalists. So this is a compilation done by uh, one of the uh, consulting firms out there, Sandhill Econometrics, uh, where they basically try to create uh, indexes of how good you would do, how well you would do with a venture investment uh, over time. And if you just invested in a single industry. So what they're doing is basically taking the, the portfolios of most venture funds, which consists typically of a variety of industries, and essentially just slicing it up 
and basically essentially creating a pure play in a given in, in a given industry or index. And one sees that as you take it into 2020 here, uh, right, that the you know the IT software has been through the roof, right? Uh, you know, uh, consumer in value, healthcare has done okay. As you get into computer hardware uh, and a variety of other stuff, uh, you're doing a lot worse. And particularly, you look at that little green line at the bottom going nowhere. And I'm afraid that's the clean tech line. Um, so what this suggests in some sense is that, you know, this is not, you know, this, this kind of disparity in terms of funding is not a totally irrational kind of thing. And we might think that, you know, the, there's a variety of aspects that uh, make, uh, you know, that make the moniker tough tech very rational, right? That um, it takes, you know, the beauty of software is you can put a little bit of money in, prove the business model, and then scale it up once you know it works. Uh, and in many of uh, these kinds of uh, tough tech investments, it takes a lot more money for things to really figure out whether they work or uh, work or, or, or not. We can talk about the difficulties in terms of market structure, right? And saying that, you know, the beauty of, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals is you get a patent and if you're curing the drug and no one else can cure it, you're, you're curing the disease and no one else can cure it, that's worth a lot. Uh, and clearly, if you're just selling electrons, you know, it's very hard to say my electrons are better than, uh, than, than your electrons in, 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 in some sense, unless there's public policy intervention. And we, but we also might say there's some rigidities in terms of the venture industry, and that may make some of this stuff, uh, you know, more difficult that there may be ways that the industry can adapt and adjust to be more successful at doing these kind of investments. And hopefully we'll hear from the panelists about exactly that topic. So without further ado, let me bring my remarks to an end and throw it open for the panelists. Thank you, Josh. Um, why don't we uh, go around our panel and uh, have some introductory thoughts and uh, comments uh, as we um, start our discussion. Um, Jane, would you like to lead us off? Sure. I think I have officially unmuted myself. It wouldn't be a Zoom call if you know somebody mm -hmm. didn't talk while muted. Um, hi, everybody. It's really it's really nice to be here. Um, as you know, I'm Jane Cairns. I'm a partner with Evoke Innovations. Um, we are a venture fund that was fund, founded in 2016. Um, our head office is in Vancouver, but with the launch of Fund2, we now have, well, we always had a Bay Area office, but we now have Seattle and uh, Toronto, which is where I'm based. Um, we're focused on climate, energy, energy transition. Um, and so Fund One was a hundred million dollar fund, um, 15 portfolio companies, four exits to date, uh, including the Canadian Venture Capital Association's deal of the year last year. And we've just announced the first close of our second fund. Uh, so that was 150 million. We're targeting 300 million for that fund. Um, and focus will be on, let me see if I can do this. I always forget one. Um, carbon capture, clean fuels, clean energy and grid, industrial innovation, uh, materials and circulation and mobility. Yes, I did it. Um, so that's broadly, you know, industrial in, uh, innovation, energy transition, climate, or sort of our, our broad focus. Series A fund, uh, fund one was, was uh, seed, fund two is series A. Um, we're happy to lead. So if any of you are out there uh, looking for, for checks and leads um, and you're working on uh, technologies that will help us solve the climate crisis, please reach out. Um, and then just, uh, sorry, I'm, it's taken a long time, but just a little bit about us because I think it's actually important to understand where we, the, the team come from on, on this and on climate. So. Uh, there are four partners. We are all entrepreneurs. Um, we are all investors. Um, and then we've got a team of, of technical experts as well. So basically, we have all spent time building businesses. And we come at this with the perspective of how do you build businesses 
that are going to have a, a really important impact on the environment and climate. And as Josh so rightly pointed out, it is not easy. Hard tech, tough tech has uh, a bit of a history, which I think we'll get into. There are some reasons why that Josh alluded to that are you know, very important to understand. Um, and we've had a bit of a spotty track record for some reasons I have some opinions on and I'm sure the rest of the panel does too. So um, yeah, just really, um, really interested in figuring out how we solve the climate crisis. Our team has a long history of doing it um, quickly. So Mike, one partner, GE, Dow, Cummins, uh, started uh, a polymer recycling business that he scaled internationally. Uh, Marty, serial entrepreneur, longtime clean tech investor, um, was doing it for 15 years before founding Evoke. Uh, Nanika was, uh, she's our Seattle based partner. She was managing um, a hard tech uh, venture portfolio for Bill Gates before joining Evoke. And then me, entrepreneur, background in finance, um, and then worked at a place called Mars in Toronto, which is one of uh, the world's largest urban innovation hubs. Uh, we worked with about 1,100 companies um, at any one time. So over the course of my nearly decade there, I worked with literally hundreds and hundreds of clean tech companies. So I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, which has been um, you know, really important um, in figuring out how we do this going forward. Okay, I'll stop. That was too much. Um, I really like what I do. Apparently, I talk about it too much. Thank you, Jane. Uh, wonderful uh, to have you. Laura, do you want to tell us a little bit about your um, new research and also about your interest in uh, the space? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I have work in venture capital and I have work on ESG, but I do not have direct work on both of them together. Um, but, you know, on the, on the one hand, my work in public markets on ESG, and I understand that ESG and impact investing are two very, very different things. And um, if you're in the area, you understand the nuances of the different vocabulary, um, but people outside the area don't yet. And so on the one hand, our work is encouraging. And so briefly what we do is we show that various screens on measures in public markets uh, don't impact your risk return trade-off. So you can, you know, be an investor that pays attention to ESG and not sacrifice returns. Um, the, the, the negative interpretation of what we find is either that th there's a lot of capital that has no such mandate, so it isn't priced yet, or everyone's doing different things so that these things are not priced um, in the aggregate. And, and that, that is consistent with conversations we've had with public company CEOs and the like as well. What I'm seeing in, in the ecosystem here in Arizona, you know, as Josh pointed out, right, software scales and other things require capital. And so it, it is harder to invest in these hard tech um, areas if, if you're a pure return seeker, um, but that doesn't mean they're bad investments. And so what we're seeing here is a lot of corporations um, acting as LPs uh, in, in devoted funds because they're the ones that are gonna have to solve their own problems, right? They're the ones who are going to um, bear the cost of regulation and the like if, if, if that comes down the, the line. And so we're seeing chemical companies um, be on the first lines of venture. Of course, it's, it's usually public funding that's on the, the basic science innovation side. So, you know, I, I think that the, you know, the capital stack for lack of a better term is going to have to get organized around these sorts of problems going forward. Thank you, Laura. Tansel, over to you to tell us a little bit about yourself and also about um, Energy Impact Partners. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm a vice president at Energy Impact Partners. We're a $2 billion venture capital fund uh, based out of New York. I think, you know, as Laura alluded to us, you know, most of our LPs, you know, they're, they're a corporation, most of them being electric utilities throughout the US and around the globe. And, and the thesis there, 
you know, we, we came to them saying, you know, your core skill set is not is not to be venture investors. And so, you know, pull your capital together and have us in, invest on your behalf, essentially. And, uh, and the reason that model really worked with utilities specifically, it's because most of them, they're either monopolies or oligopolies. So they don't really care if they collaborate or share best practices with each other because everybody has their own service territory and they all benefit from, from kind of hearing from each other. And so that, that's our business model in a nutshell. Um, you know, one thing we really look for, not only we provide capital to a lot of these companies, you know, one big goal of ours is making sure that most of the companies we invest in, they have an opportunity to, you know, commercialize their technology within our LP base. So we also have a dedicated team just to do that specifically. Um, and we're pretty flexible. Like, you know, most of our investment will do them in the US, but we chase opportunities. So we'll do stuff in Europe. We've done things in, in Canada as well. Um, and we've been around since about 2016. We're onto our second fund. And, and, you know, initially we just had one strategy, which was mostly doing early stage VC uh, in climate tech specifically. But we, we've kind of grown that because we realized that there's many places in the capital stack where we can play as, as a fund. So we also have a credit fund. We have, you know, higher risk investment that are focused on long-term long shot decarbonization, um, funds to invest in, in my minority founders, uh, funds specifically for Europe and Asia. So I think we, we've, we've broadened our strategy to make sure, because we're seeing a lot of innovation happen. And I think especially these last two years, we've seen a ton of activity in the space. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a great time to be in venture and it's an even more exciting time you know, to invest in, in climate tech. Thank you, thank you, Tantel. So, um, why don't we uh, go back, Josh, to um, the the data that you presented, and I think all of you kind of alluded to as well. Um, so, in in thinking about why clean clean tech uh, investments haven't really, you know, uh, or at least been um, as 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 growth oriented as uh, that that you see in IT uh, in or in other fields, um, is there and you know is there a um, a place here for more public private partnership type um, funds to come in to perhaps uh, mitigate the early stage risk or perhaps in some other ways to um, get get this uh, jump started. Josh, uh, why don't we start off with, with you and then. There we go. Um, so I think it's a great question. I mean, I think that certainly you can look at a lot of areas within, you know, climate and impact investing and point to one piece of public policy that pretty much every economist agrees is something that would be a great thing to do. Uh, it also seems to be completely impossible, which is obviously putting a real price at carbon that reflects the, you know, the sort of social externalities, sort of the negative social externalities associated with, uh, with, with the carbonization of the world, right? And, you know, one can think about a lot of areas, you know, one of the areas that we've had a student team and we've been trying to do some research on, which is, you know, forest conservation finance is a great illustration of this. You know, essentially, if you want to do an investment in forest, you know, right, you get, you know, these sort of, you can get these tiny carbon credits, you can get, maybe do a little timber cutting, you do uh, some selling off some conservation restrictions and so forth. But just the economics of it just aren't really very good, right? And, you know, until there is sort of more of a real price on, carbon, it's going to be very hard to do that. Now, it's not to say that there haven't been relevant investments done. So there was a fascinating company funded that basically is using, you know, low earth satellite data to try to monitor deforestation and even seeing the quality of what's grown. Because, you know, one of the points that's been made is that a lot of the, the um, you know, the, the offsets that are done, people plant just, you know, very inappropriate trees which die very quickly and so forth. And there's never any kind of follow through or monitoring on it. So sort of there you say, here's the case where it's really more of a, uh, you know, a IT style investment, right? It's really software that's the crucial engine that's allowing one to 
at least shed some light on you know a big complicated kind of problem without having the the carbon pricing but it it seems that certainly that would be the most direct solution to i think a lot of what we've been talking about as challenges here thank you um jane um so you know just yes i i don't i don't have a lot more to say on carbon pricing like yes we need we need a price on carbon um if we don't start pricing those externalities it it um, becomes incredibly complicated to meet our climate targets and frankly it's existential so yes we need a price on carbon um i guess i'll also approach it from a slightly um a slightly different angle which is we we have a lot of these technologies um you know through various stages of venture capital a lot of the technologies have actually been largely de-risked the challenge comes um when we get to the deployment side of things um and you know if we don't deploy the technologies they don't have the impact that we need so so you know deployment and execution becomes super critical and a lot of the you know th this comes down in a lot of cases to project finance or infrastructure finance those are large dollars that come from places like pension funds um and they are inherently risky they are managing or risk averse they are they are managing people's retirement income so um you know we've got this we've got this gap that we see um between you know getting the getting the technology development developed and then getting the technology deployed so i think there's a role in there for government um, perhaps for philanthropy, the, the tax laws are different in the US than in Canada. In Canada, we can't actually use philanthropic dollars um, in that way yet, but you can in the States. Um, so as a way to offset risk, to enable the private capital to flow into the sector, because frankly, we can't do this all with government dollars or philanthropic dollars. We need the entire capital stack, like everybody needs to be playing in order to be able to deploy these technologies. Um, yeah, so so I think there's a I think there's something there that needs to be uh, explored further, which is how do we de-risk deployment so that private capital will continue to, to flow in or start to flow in and fund the execution of these projects. Thanks. Laura, moving on to you. Uh, uh, what do you think um, from the public market perspective, um, you know, do you see that, uh, is there any connection of corporate companies setting up VC arms perhaps in this particular space? So I, I haven't seen that directly yet, but you, you know, you've seen, you've seen corporations, you, you know, Put a little bit of money to work, right? Because they have to, um, you, you know. And I'd be curious from the other panelists what the differences are in U.S. versus Europe, right? So companies that operate in Europe have had to adapt to different standards than here. Um, you, you know, on, on the public side, I, another encouraging thing that one can see from the data is there there has been a massive taste change over the past, you know, decade or so. So that there, there were higher realized returns for companies that implemented what whatever it was that led them to have good scores by the various agencies. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're going to have a different sort of expected return profile going forward. So you know, we're we're seeing inches rather than leaps. I guess is how I would characterize it. But I I um, maybe the U.S. can learn policy directives from elsewhere in the world. Thanks. Um, Tansel, going over to you, um, you, you uh, your company works uh, exclusively on energy. And so uh, we also see that there is a lot of clean energy patents that, uh, that are filed by um, you know, oil and gas companies, for example. Um, and uh, however, uh, obviously on the ESG, um, uh, metrics, they are uh, not at all ranked. Um, 
And do you work with, um, do any of them, are any of them LPs in your funds or uh, do you see them taking an active interest in this space? Yeah, I would say yes to both. So absolutely, I think when I, when I started doing climate tech investing about you know, four or five years ago, I don't think it was as prominent, but I would say really over the last two years, I think, what did you see? Maybe it was something like eight or nine oil majors committed to net zero by 2050, which is something you know, five, 10 years ago, you would never thought about. They're denying climate change. So they're definitely more, and they have a lot of capital, right? These companies are spending 25, 50 billion each a year on, on CapEx. So they have a lot of capital to throw out these problems. And we've seen most of them, you know, spin up their own, you know, corporate venture capital arms. So for example, Shell has one, uh, Chevron has one, and they're pretty active. Sometimes, you know, we've co-invested with them on deals. Uh, they also, you know, they invest a lot, whether either at the very early stage, so that they'll invest in startup companies, they'll invest in utility scale projects, like, you know, solar, wind, offshore wind, things like that. Uh, they're also investing a lot in, um, in charging infrastructure because they're realizing their business model is going to get disrupted. I think now you're at a point where it's not, is the, you know, they're not wondering, is this going to happen? They know it's going to happen. So, you know, they're being pretty aggressive about it. Uh, so, yeah, I think net net it's positive, but, you know, they're still very, very big polluters. Um, and the other thing we're seeing, you know, there's a little bit of friction between, you know, utilities and oil and gas companies because eventually both of them are going to be in the business of selling electricity once we kind of roll off of, of all this oil and gas. And that said, so then the question is, you know, who is going to own stuff like your charging infrastructure? Is it the city? Is it the utility? Is it the oil and gas company? Uh, so it, it's a very interesting time. And even, you know, I think you'll see it even with the car manufacturers, everybody's going electric, they're making all these commitments. So you're seeing all these historically big polluters coming into the space because they realize that their business model is being disrupted. And they look at companies like Tesla, you know, which have huge valuations and the public markets are receptive to it. And all these, you know, C-suite executives are thinking, you know, we need to do something like this to see a nice uplift in our stock price. So I think you know, people are voting with their wallets and they're seeing that um, decarbonization is, 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 the, is the new thing and it's a massive opportunity. I think it's something like if we go net zero by 2050, it's something like $5 trillion a year in spend. So it's gonna be a massive opportunity for a lot of companies and a, a big wealth transfer over the, the next 30 to, to 50 years. Great, okay, so. Um, uh, my summary so far, uh, very, very briefly, is we, we, we know that there is a lot of big players in, in this space, uh, the incumbents in the public markets who have apparently a lot of capex uh, and potential investment that they can bring to the table. Yet the puzzle seems that uh, on the, on, on, on the private, in the private markets, we do not observe that investment um, um, we do not observe that investment in early stage technologies and startups at the scale that uh, we have seen in the other sectors. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Why is this, why is this happening? Can I throw in my hat in yes. the ring here? And yes. um, I would be really interested in hearing Tansel's thoughts about this as well. Um, as well as the other panelists, which is, um, you know, it's, it certainly seems like there is a sort of disconnect between the kind of innovation that we normally associate with clean tech. And, you know, sometimes what we think about is big utility kind of innovation, right? Where, you know, things are being operating at, you know, qual you know reliability standards of 99.99% and so forth. And here, right, we know that the modal outcome is failure and, Often it's, I mean, it, it just seems from, you know, whether case studies or more uh, advisory stuff I've done in terms of, you know, with some of the large utility companies that it's, it's almost like, a, you know, Mars and Venus kind of thing in terms of just being a very different approach to innovation. It's not impossible, but I'm willing to guess that a lot of the work you guys do at your fund is just trying to get people comfortable with the whole process of what innovation in clean tech looks like vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, hardening a grid to make it, uh, you know, completely reliable, even in a hurricane type condition. 
No, I, I completely agree. And I think there's some areas where we see them being very receptive and then somewhere it's very tough. So I think, you know, the utility scale stuff, for example, solar and wind, that took them a while to get used to it. You know, things like zero thermal, they're not doing it. If you want to spin up something like nuclear, it takes a while. But where we've seen them being very receptive, it thinks, it's things where it's like much more, you know, low touch for implementation. Like if you build a power plant, you most likely have it for 10, 15 years, you can't turn it off. Whereas software, right, you become a customer one year, you don't like it, the next year you can get rid of it. So things like, for example, cybersecurity, which now has become as important for resiliency, we're seeing very fast adoption. And if not, you know, utilities are probably with banks and things like that, some of the top and fastest adopters of the, those technologies. So I think in certain areas, they're ahead and in certain areas, it's been very, very tough for us to get them to adopt things because one, they move very slowly. Two, their, their biggest focus is it's resiliency and low cost of energy. And then you have externalities like things like, uh, you know, emissions, which they have to do over time, but it's not immediate. And the other thing too, which I think doesn't help at all, is that they're regulated, right? So you, your, your need to innovate and outcompete your competition, it's there to a certain extent, but it's like five, 10 year cycles. Whereas when you look in Europe, fully deregulated markets, you know, you're seeing much more innovation and much faster decarbonization there. So let me jump in here with a question from our audience, um, Tansal, since you brought out this uh, regulated industry idea. So uh, the question is that, you know, we know that healthcare is also a highly regulated industry, yet um, there is a huge amount of investment in biotech and so on. In, in fact, you know, in Boston, uh, you know, we, we, we kind of have a whole lot of that happening here. So what is the, uh, what is the, is there, do you think that there is more of a, uh, this is uh, more because of a balance in play of, uh, in terms of returns from investment in this space? So is it, is it, is it a discounting factor like uh, that, that we are thinking about? Is it, um, you know, what Josh alluded to about having a patent that kind of protects the innovation for the drug uh, for 20 years. So is, is that the reason? Jane, would you like to start off? Sure. Um, Tencel may be uh, more up, up the curve on specifics of uh, the regulations. Um, they're both very heavily regulated. They're regulated differently. Um, and the outcomes are, are different. So if you think about a utility to Josh's, no, I think it was your point, um, you know, an electron is an electron. And so you're kind of competing against an incumbent technology. In a lot of cases with biotech, you're solving a problem that hasn't been solved yet. Um, and so because of that, this is, this is my somewhat uneducated take on it, but I think because of that, um, there is... Uh, like, yes, there is process that you have to go through. You know, you have to go through your um, phase one, two, three trials um, in order to have, say, a new drug approved. But that's a very clear process. And at the end, I think the adoption is more clear because you end up with a product that solves a very specific and as yet often unsolved problem. Um, it's, a little, it's a little trickier um, with utilities and electrons, but... I don't know, Tetzel probably has a, a, a more detailed answer on that one. I, I think from my, my perspective, like linking, you know, regulation and, and valuation, I think it, it clearly leads to a discount. And, and my rationale there is because if you're regulated and you have monopoly, less need to, to innovate. If there's less need to innovate, you know, you're buying stuff at a slower pace. And so if you're a startup and you're selling into a heavily regulated industry, you know, it takes you whatever, 12, 18, 24 months to get a sale done and you're not growing as fast. And these kind of startups are not as attractive to investors where we wanna see like 100, 200% growth year over year. And as a result, you know, when we're pricing these deals, we're giving them a lower valuation because we realize that your potential to hit escape velocity growth is more limited because you're selling it to an industry that it is not forced to innovate as faster or as fast as other industry like tech or, or retail, where you know it's it's extremely competitive uh, and it's it's much less regulated. So perhaps uh, you know, but uh, I mean, I mean, my uh, take on this would be that 
uh, wouldn't there be public financial market pressure on this? I understand the regulation point. I understand the point about uh, uh, having a captured market. But uh, if the public markets are putting weight on ESG, if uh, firms, if there is a, tr a reward on that front, then wouldn't that bring or translate an impact into how they are adopting newer technologies, clean tech, et cetera, into, this, um, into their operations? Laura, do you have, do you have a, a insight on this from the ESG okay. front? Yeah, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I mean, there are just, there are too many players out there in the market that just don't care, right? So it's, um, you know, I moderated a panel yesterday from family offices that were all in on oil and gas, given the disruptions in the market from the, from publicly traded banks, right? So um, another part, you know, when we talk about clean tech, that Yes, there are those that are going to be selling into utilities, right? Where there we have a few, you know, the few buyer problem and and and, and all sorts of um, issues with what the payment stream and the incentive to make large capital investments are there. But you know, on the edges, there 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 should be lots of profitable opportunities and lots of profitable investments, right? You know, there are you know, wind and wind and solar are taking hold um but i you know we can't forget that it takes a cartel to prop up the price of fossil fuels right it, it, it's very cheap so it's um you, you know you won't get an argument from an economist not to price carbon but how do you set the price right you just pick, pick one arbitrarily and then iterate around it that's what we did in canada <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think this actually ties back, Devarshi, to your to your previous question um, that really, for me, was around adoption and a, you know adoption by corporates, um, and the the two things are kind of linked. Like having spent nearly a decade at Mars, where I was you know trying to actively build markets for our companies to sell into, like. My head is bruised from banging it against the wall with corporates trying to um, trying to figure out how to encourage adoption of technologies. The, the motivation is um, by and large quite low because you know we call it clean tech, but it's really industrial tech. Like everything that happens in clean tech and climate tech is industrial technology. Industrial companies are by necessity risk averse, right? Like people invest in their utilities because they want that utility to deliver electrons and they get a return that they, they are super comfortable with is going to go on for the long term because that utility is very reliable at delivering electrons. And you can translate that into the chemical industry, the oil and gas industry, you know, all of the industries that really are the adopters of, of clean tech. They are extremely risk averse. Um, with good reason. And I spent, I, I, my team at Mars um, worked really hard. Like we had a whole group that worked with, um, with large corporates, teaching them how to adopt innovation. And there were so many challenges that we came across that were like so unexpected. Cause I was like, technology's proven cheaper than what you're doing already adoption is is the logical next step um but it's just not it's not the way they think they think about being careful they think about not having any industrial accidents and they think about ensuring that they are delivering their product to their end consumer so that their shareholders are happy so it's um we've got this big circular thing that's happening around risk adoption public markets, they're, they're, they're inextricably linked. Thanks, Jane. Josh, um, coming back to you, what, uh, what are your thoughts on um, you know, biotech? Uh, why do we have uh, on the regulation front and you know, investments in? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it is an extremely interesting area and it, it certainly deserves more, more thought. I mean, I guess 
you know, one thing that is intriguing is that there has been, you know, certainly some efforts to try to differentiate good electrons from bad electrons, right? You know, you can certainly in your power bill opt to get the clean energy. And, you know, you can sort of see that as a sort of small step in that direction. But um, in, in some sense, the um, figuring out ways, right? I mean, you can sort of think about there really being process and product in, innovation, right? And in some sense, in pharma, you know, the path to very clear product innovation is there because as we pointed out, when he has this sort of uh, real differentiation in terms of the ability to, you know, you know, either it cures your particular kind of cancer or it doesn't. And clearly the willingness to pay is gonna be very high if it does, right? Which, you know, in some sense, you know, you, you can, you know, certainly expect that while people are willing to pay more for clean electrons, is it 5% or 10%? I don't think it's 100%, right? Maybe the world will change some and we'll eventually get there, but I don't sense that the world is at that point where there's a large mass of people willing to pay twice as much for, uh, for, for clean electrons. And so in a way, you know, that, that sort of goes back to, I think, Tenso's comment about the importance, of, you know, the, the fact that a lot of the innovation has been on the process side for things like, you know, software resiliency and so forth, right? Because there, clearly there is some sort of potential for direct, direct, uh, direct benefits. That's at least one way of, uh, one way of thinking about that. And, you know, I think you probably can see this in a lot of ways in, areas like forest finance as well, right? You know, in some sense, you know, if you were, you know, getting a table made of sustainably harvested wood, you'd be willing to pay somewhat more for it, but probably not hugely more as well. Tansel, um, uh, coming back to uh, you on, um, um, on this, so you, um, you know, again, uh, this is a question from one of our audience actually. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, when you're working with these utility companies, you see the difference in trying to push major stuff versus the, uh, the marginal um, um, innovations, uh, which are easier, as you said. So how do you see, uh, can venture, venture capital, like, you know, at the very beginning, uh, as Josh outlined, right, even though this is half of a percent that of startups that get funded, uh, the the uh, in in the public domain it accounts for about ninety percent of the R and D expenditure of public companies, about seventy percent of the market capitalization of public companies. So, if so, so it's a it's it's an oversized role that venture capital does play in the business strategy of public companies of existing public companies. So, how do you see? And uh, you know, also to you, Jane, the same question: How do you see the role of venture capital in shaping this? particularly for climate finance? I, th I mean, I think, I think we have an important role to play because, uh, you know, as Josh alluded to a lot of times, you know, some of these companies, they will be successful because of venture capital because they're just running cash flow negatives for the first five years. And if you don't have a venture capitalist to plug in the hole, you know, there's nowhere to go. Uh, so I think it, it is very important uh, to have venture capital. I think there's certain areas where we, where you know there's less red tape, less leg, less regulation, and there's big adoption where we can be more impactful. I think an easy example of that is EVs. I think consumers are saying we want EVs. You know, there's a bunch of there's a whole software stack that needs to be developed. If you know you're going to see wide adoption, there's a lot of charging that needs to go in place. And so I think in those places, it's a good place for for venture capital to come in and play because we can we can provide capital, know how, and really make a difference. And then there's other things that it's a little bit tougher, you know, like maybe the next generation of fusion, right? That's maybe 15, 20 years down the line. Maybe that's more fit for somebody like Bill Gates where he's not really motivated by financial returns, but more, you know, impact and, and legacy, right? And so it, it just kind of depends uh, where you want to play. But I think most of the time, if it's, if it's software-based, we can add a lot of value because we're, we're really comfortable with these business models We'll have them grown, um, and there there's room for you know somewhat rapid adoption there. Yeah, I mean, I I totally agree, and you know, obviously, so 
I, my entire career has been focused on clean tech and climate. And I've been doing this for far longer than I care to admit. I've, I, I was initially investing in clean tech before the term clean tech even existed. So I believe in, you know, the importance of, of venture for making this happen. And the one thing that I wanted to just sort of highlight in terms of, you know, is there, is there a, a, a role for venture to play in, you know, encouraging um, investments in, in sort of climate friendly companies, I guess I'll call them. Um, and something is happening that has happened before and actually created huge problems um, and gave clean tech a very bad name, um, which was a lot of people uh, it, for me, it started in 2000, 2001. A lot of people made a lot of money um, in the dot-com boom and then went, oh, I want to do something good with my money. Um, I'm going to invest in things that are good for the environment. And, you know, there's a huge difference, as has been pointed out several times, there's a huge difference between investing in software and investing in hard physical things and infrastructure. And some really terrible investment decisions were made, and people lost a lot of money. Um, it happened again in, you know, um, uh, sort of 2009 to 12. Again, lots of people lost a lot of money, but you know, learning, learning from the first one. Not as many problems, not as much money lost, and we're seeing the same thing now, driven by things like um, COP26. Uh, all of the climate commitments that governments are making, that corporates are making. Um, there is, again, this push towards environment and climate. Um, and so because of that, a lot of new investors are coming into the space, which is fantastic. Like this, this is not a problem that can be solved by, you know, Cancel and I like this is we need all the brains we need all the money we like this is this is as I said before an existential problem so having all of this new money come in is really important it's amazing that it's focusing on it um, we just have to make sure that we're making good investment decisions because if we go back to you know the early days and people losing money again um, money will start to flow out and um, and that's problematic so. Um, I do really think that we are at a time right now where venture capital has a really important and smart role to play. We need to be smart about what we're doing because we can't, we can't have another setback. I would, I would just add one quick thing. I, I was reading something interesting. They were saying, you know, when there was this whole euphoria about EV vehicles and, and SPACs, they were saying the last time, and a lot of them went public with zero revenue. And they were saying the last time we saw this many companies go public with zero revenue, it was during the dot-com bubble 20 years ago. So of course you're gonna have you know stories and investments that work, but a lot of people, you know, they said, I'm producing zero cars today, I'm gonna do a million a year in five years, and people are willing to buy into that. And you're optimistic, but you're dealing with physical goods at the end of the day, and it's very hard to execute on. And especially even more now with inflation and supply chain challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the one hand, I guess you can argue that every, you know, technological revolution has had this sort of cycle of hype to it, right? That there's been a variety of research that's looked at, you know, the arrival of electricity and even earlier canals and stuff like that, railroads, right? Where you had a lot of frothiness, uh, you know, this sort of boom kind of activity with lots of people rushing in, and then this sort of very painful shakeout with you know, the people who survive being much stronger in the sector being, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, getting to the place of influence that it has, you know, to this day. Um, I guess the challenge is that, you know, you can also imagine cases where you have this, you know, just as you have overreaction on the way up, you have overreaction on the way down. And you get people just, you know, essentially walking away from, you know, investments that might actually be quite attractive ones because they just, you know, everybody knows that this sector doesn't really, doesn't really work, right? And, you know, one of the fascinating areas has been this, um, you know, the experience of, um, you know, the, 
many of the um, companies that were doing early versions of the personal computer in the mid 1970s, which was a severe venture drought where they just couldn't get funding for the life of them. And we know that like 10 years later, the sector was really there and you know, maybe there was, you know, there was indeed some ensuing technological innovation in that decade. But you can also imagine that you know, had investors not been so negative on you know, personal technology during that period because they'd been battered by losing so much money in the early 70s that much of that stuff could have been advanced a few years. So in a way that's, that in some sense is the challenge is how do you preserve the good without having the, 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 the throffiness, you know, easier said than done, of course. Yeah. So um, um, thanks, Josh. Uh, so I would like to uh, incorporate a couple of the comments and questions coming in from the audience. And uh, I think just based off our last discussion, uh, maybe this is a question for you, Laura and Josh. Um, given, um, so first a clarification, actually, Tansel, when you talked about uh, Bill Gates, uh, you know, perhaps uh, investing in fusion. I, uh, is, it, is it true to uh, kind of interpret that what you mean is much more patient capital than, you know, typically what a standard uh, VC fund would do, which is like a 10 year uh, uh, horizon? Um, is, is, is that kind of what you, what do you mean? I mean, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and we're big believers in it. And so we realize that, you know, we see a lot of these opportunities too, right? Long shots, deep decarbonization bet, but that don't fit the traditional, you know, 10 year model, right? And so what right. we did also to address that because we see a lot of deals in that space, we launched just a dedicated vehicle and also your risk appetite is much different, right? Me as a VC, if I'm making 10 investment, I may be expecting two or three to fail, but I need to make the money on the seven others. Uh, but I think in the deep decarbonization stuff, it's gonna be more like you make 10 investments you know, seven or eight are gonna fail, but on the one or two where you make money, you're gonna make 50, 100 X, but it's gonna take much longer. So you need dedicated strategy and you're seeing these funds emerge. Like, you know, we have one, there's lower carbon, there's a few others, a lot of them like breakthrough that by Bill Gates. Uh, so it's emerging, but you know, what I would caution against is we're seeing, you know, valuation kind of get out of hand in those spaces. You know, there's companies that are just making scientific breakthroughs and milestone but no commercialization yet you know and they're going from a hundred million dollar pre to 500 million dollar pre all of a sudden just because your proof of concept work and they're raising massive amounts of money and so the expectations keep getting higher and higher and those businesses there's not necessarily salvage value because it's binary right either it works or it doesn't whereas software it's like sometimes you can get build a great product you just never could go to market engine was not good right so I think, of course, there's going to be successes, but there's going to be a lot of pains and you need a specific dedicated strategy to, to address that, I would say. Okay. So if you can tell, uh, tell us a little bit quickly about what is the basic structural difference in this particular fund that you're talking about versus a standard you know, VC fund like we see as a 10-year closed-end fund. So it's, it's, first of all, it's, it, it's longer. So it's about 15 years. And second of all, it's a dedicated strategy, like me as a VC fund, because I said, you know, maybe if I'm expecting one or two to really do well in this deep, deep, deep decarbonization bet, I need to have a lot of bets, right? I need to place 30, 40, 50 bets. Whereas, you know, if I'm doing that out of my normal fund and I'm only placing two or three or four bets, I'm setting myself up for failures because I don't have enough shots on goal. So you really need a dedicated strategy that allows you to have enough shots on goal to do something that works because if I'm only making three, four, five of these investments and they all go to zero, most likely I'm never gonna do it again, right? Mm -hmm. Josh? Can I jump in with a couple observations? Yeah. One of which is, I mean, I, I sort of hinted at this in my remarks and I was trying to avoid doing a filibuster, but now I guess I will do a filibuster, which is that, you know, in a way, I think what Tunzel's getting at is really important stuff, right? Which is, you know, saying, that the venture model is not necessarily suited for all kinds of investments, right? I mean, when you sort of think about this, right? You say, where did the you know ten year fund life you know come from? Well, the story seems to be that when General Draper was getting the first venture partnership together in Silicon Valley in 1958, he went to the lawyers and they said, well, 
here's an oil and gas partnership and let's use that. Uh, and, you know, that basically said you got, you know, five years to go dig, dr drill for oil and then another five years to get it out and liquidate it. Uh, not quite, but more or less. And, you know, we can then say, well, that really mirrored, you know, British shipping contracts. And, you know, David Rubenstein says this is all basically from Genoese and Venetian shipping, you know, partnerships in the 14th century. And, you know, others say it all goes back to the Code of Hammurabi, though you'd have to really squint hard to find it in the Code of Hammurabi in 1900 BC. But be that as may, right, you know, we, you know, in a way, it seems like there was basically, like often lawyers do, they took one thing, scratched out one thing, put something else in, and said, here, use this. Meanwhile, we'll send you a big bill for all the hours we could have spent for writing it from scratch, but that's a whole nother subject. Um, but the, you know, there's a real sense in which you can imagine that there's need for innovation on the front end and the back end, right? The back end, I think, you know, was very well articulated here in terms of saying, there are going to be some investments where just holding it for longer is going to make sense. I and mean, we've seen this in infrastructure, for instance. You know, if you build a highway with an expected life of 40 years, the idea of selling it after 10 years is often not the most net present value creating thing because of all the rigidities that there are just not that many people who want to buy highways. And you're probably much better off holding it for its useful life of 40 years if you as a long-term investor want to maximize, uh, you know, maximize net present value. And similarly, you can imagine that, you know, sort of pushing for premature exits on some of these long-term deals might make sense. I think the other area is clearly in terms of thinking about the early stages, right? And, you know, here clearly we've seen examples of innovations where people are trying to combine some features of the incubator accelerator model with the kind of difficulties of clean tech. And you know, obviously with the, you know, the engine here in town being a prime example thereof, but basically where, you know, there's clearly more subsidization in terms of funding, you know, without this expectation necessarily that people are going to graduate in eight weeks and be kicked out into the world to fend for themselves and so forth. You could really imagine that there's sort of probably a lot more that can be done both at the front end and back end. And probably, you know, again to some of the remarks earlier, you know, probably with much greater involvement of corporates and other partners earlier in the earlier in the process than would be necessarily the case for a software firm. Thanks, Josh. Jane, um, do you uh, also have any any fund that uh, it's uh, kind of uh, thinking about a different structure in your investments or? Um, so. I'm sorry, actually, could I also add something to it? Uh, as you mentioned right at the beginning, you're uh, kind of uh, launching a Series A fund right now. Yeah. And um, um, what are the different methodological attributes you might uh, think of? How do you screen your investments? Like, is there a way for you to kind of quantify or qualify uh, the portfolio investments that you are going to make in, on, on this? Or Yeah, so it's... It's a good question. It's actually a topic of conversation. Um, so um, let me answer the first question because it's a, it's a quick one. Um, our fund one was different. Um, fund one was seed stage and it was anchored by uh, corporate strategics who had a very specific mission um, in the energy transition. And so that fund the, the lens was very much around, can we, it, actually a lot like EIP, can we solve specific challenges for the industry? Um, and also financial return, obviously. Second fund um, is slightly different. Um, and because of what we've already talked about with length of time to commercialize, it's uh, 12 plus one plus one. So potentially a 14 year fund life. Again, it takes a long time to commercialize these things. Um, how do we screen? So we've, <laughs> we've sort of had this conversation back and forth um, around quantifying um, outcomes. Um, so, you know, we have, a, we have an ESG lens. Um, ESG, you know, 
fully, not, not just climate, but from a climate perspective, um, we've actually chosen not to do climate modeling upfront, um, partly because I think we've all worked in the space long enough because um, we're all old and been around um, and we have a relatively good gut sense on um, what will have climate and um, climate impacts. And it's based on the, the theses that we have developed um, and the impact that a company will have depends on how it's rolled out. So if it rolls out in three years versus five years versus 10 years, the climate impact is dramatically different. So what we've chosen to do is pick our verticals, know and understand what's deeply important to us as both individuals and as a firm in terms of, of impact um, and to use that as our, as our lens. Um, but it's an, honestly, it's an ongoing conversation. Everybody, um, Everybody is still learning um, and something we can talk about later if you want. We, we're just in the process of doing our first ESG report on fund one. Um, and so, you know, had some learnings there on, on the ESG lens as well. Great, thank you, Jane. Um, so um, going back to perhaps uh, one of our questions from the audience, uh, this is from my colleague, Philip Wells. Um, Philip says, it seems that part of the issue with adoption in clean tech is the hesitancy of large risk averse corporations. Tesla sort of bypassed this uh, by appealing directly to consumers and has of course been hugely successful. Do we just need more Teslas who basically approach these markets from more of a direct to consumer point of view? Although it's probably not uh, tough to come up with a direct to consumer type home runs. Is, is, is there enough uh, direct to consumer uh, opportunities that could change the tip the balance? I don't know. So I'll be interested in what the rest of the gang has to say. We honestly don't see a lot of direct consumer opportunities because so many of the things are, are industrial. Um, the other thing is Elon Musk is unique in his ability to create these incredibly difficult companies based on um, an outcome that he wants to achieve. So yeah, I mean, bypassing the corporates would be, in some senses, delightful. And you know, the other the other side of that is then you have to figure out how to market to individuals um, and keep your company alive for the you know decade it takes to do that. Like I first saw Tesla when I was working in New York, so that was you know like twenty years ago, basically, not quite. Um, you know. It was not an overnight success and he nearly went broke a zillion times and you know he's he's elon musk so he pulled through but it's there's challenges on both sides of that one is all i'm trying to say and also and it is fair to say solar city right was struggled the, right yeah. despite the elon magic which is undoubtedly there and, and there are electric you know, you know, there are regulation barriers as well, right? So here, you know, I'm I'm in Arizona, and uh, you know, you want to put solar on your roof, you buy electricity also, right? So um, they can they can kill a lot of direct to consumer um, with with policy. Correct. So uh, given given our uh, you know discussion so far, um, perhaps we could um, talk a little bit about. Um, you know, what are the opportunities at this point in time going forward in, in trying to address these issues? Where do you each think that, uh, you know, the biggest um, return is um, in, in, in investing um, in, in, in venture funds? I mean, for venture funds in investing in sectors that can move the needle, um, is this... Um, is this a lost cause uh, for uh, uh, the traditional independent venture capital funds, or is this something that is going to be always dominated by the corporates? Or how can we co-opt the corporates? Do we need public intervention uh, to get in? Like uh, Josh, you have done uh, a research on SBIR grants uh, earlier on, which uh, you know they they kind of have relaxed these financial constraints greatly for young startups. Do we need a different uh, envisioning of uh, SBIR in, in some sense? Well, if you take uh, Sabrina Howell's work, which focused specifically on the 
energy area and SBI are grants, right? I mean, she argued, you know, the results were, I mean, her results were very compelling. She basically did a uh, comparison of the guys who were just above and just below the cutoff for DOE to give grants uh, and compared what the outcomes of the companies were and basically argued that SBI award phase one awards had huge positive impacts in terms of patenting, employment growth, uh, willingness to, you know, ability to go out and raise venture and angel finding and so forth as a real catalytic effect. On the other hand, when she looked at the phase two awards, the much larger second phase, there was basically no noticeable impact of that on the firms. And when, you know, when she looked a little deeper at it, you know, a lot of it seemed to be that, you know, the phase one awardees were young, hungry, little startups, which really had, you know, many cases were really nascent things where they really needed to get ready for prime time. And the quarter million, half million, you know, you know, 100,000, you know, a couple hundred thousand hours from SBR could make an enormous difference in terms of being able to get the business into shape where a venture capitalist could take them seriously. But when you look at who was actually applying for the phase twos, it was overwhelmingly, you know, the, the dread uh, SBIR mills, the, you know, companies which are basically, you know, habitual winners of these awards and just go from award to award, you know, basically uh, professional grant writing shops. Uh, and essentially the venture guys, you know, either they, they, you know, with their little phase one, they were able to go and turn their focus to private financing and basically, you know, sort of ended up opting out of the SBIR award. That being said, you know, essentially the 80% of the money goes to phase two in SBIR, right? And this problem with the mills has been documented for 30 years and there's been absolutely no effort, to, no real momentum to change it, largely because essentially if you're a little company and you get one of these awards and then go on to getting VC, you say, thanks. And that's the last time you think about it. Well, if you're an organization that's living on this stuff, you know, you're going to have a whole cast of lobbyists, you know, every time Congress that comes to basically block any kind of changes to the program that's disadvantageous to yourself. So, you know, I don't think that it's that public policy can't play a role. It's just that, you know, as I'm afraid I have said repeatedly in my life, you know, the sort of forces that sort of end up either, you know, distorting the program, you know, in well intention, but unproductive kind of ways or else, you know, the sort of capture problems can often make these programs far less efficient or far less effective than they would be otherwise. Thanks, Josh. But, but in general, the model of um, government funding, then venture at exactly the right time and then moving on to another source of funding that isn't quite venture equity um, is probably the way this is gonna go. Um, and you know, just getting all the institutional um, partnerships necessary to build around that is is probably where we need to head. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know, probably a phase one, for example, is probably when the financial constraint is the most, and so therefore the SBIR grant really helps these small innovative firms to jump to the next stage. Uh, um, so, um, uh, Tansel, Jane, do you uh, look at, when you look at uh, your investments, uh, do you look at uh, outcomes uh, such as SBIR grants that uh, these companies have been successful at? Or uh, I wouldn't say so. I think, you know, most of the time, like, we're on the writing this deal, and I think the nice thing with, with energy, it's like, once you have a proof, like, let's say you're doing power generation or something like that, you know, you can get rid of, you know, venture capital much faster, right? Your cost of capital can go down much faster, go down lower much faster. Uh, so, you know, they'll go to traditional infrastructure investors and things like that for that capital. But I think now more and more, you know, because we want to repatriate the supply chain, we want to make our own batteries, things like that. We're seeing our companies seeking that funding a little bit more because it's very cheap and it's much more accessible. Um, but historically that, that hasn't really been the case. And we don't really underwrite to it. Like we think it's an upside, but when we're thinking about these deals, we're saying, you know, most likely you'll go to an infrastructure provider. And it's not that expensive, right? Our cost of capital as VC is probably 25, 30% infrastructure, five, 10, 15, if it's really unproven technology. Uh, so that's not what we're really underwriting to, but it's capital that's there. And I think 
net net it's going to benefit not only us but the other companies as well thanks we look at it slightly differently and part of it's because we're um we're based in canada so i should also say i'm the only canadian partner um the other three even though we're based in canada the other three partners are american um although marty has just become a canadian citizen so i guess i have another canadian um the 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 grant landscape in Canada is a little bit different. And I don't want to go down that, that path because um, I don't think it's relevant to most people here. But I wouldn't say we look at, um, you know, have, has, we, we don't use not access to non-dilutive funding as a, as a screen, um, but it is a really important piece of, you know, companies, especially companies doing hard tech, to get their um, intellectual property in place, to you know, to develop their technology to a point where it actually becomes investable. So it's not a hard like, yes, no, um, you know, you didn't get grant funding. We're not that interested. But but we definitely see the impact that that funding can have um, in Canada. Just really quickly, we have a thing called Sustainable Development Technology Canada, and what they do. Um, it's been around for about 20 years. It's the reason we have such a strong clean tech sector in Canada, um, amongst other things. Um, and essentially they require, so it's a, they, they fund um, a commercial scale pilot um, and they require you to bring um, a consortium together around it. And so basically you go from not commercial to commercial in partnership with corporates. And it's been a super successful model for getting technology development, for getting it slightly de-risked, and for creating the partnerships with um, potential adopters that we've been saying have been missing from the sector. So it, I, something like that doesn't exist in the States, but you know, if there's any policy people out there, it's a good model. So do you, do you have a more... Uh, um you know, going back to an earlier discussion, do you think that that really helps in Canada to get uh, the corporates to adopt the, the, the marginally significant changes uh, that come with these technologies in some sense? It's not a silver bullet, but it helps. But it helps. Okay, great. Um, so we, uh, I think we are almost um, uh, close to our um, end of this panel discussion. Uh, you know, we can go on for a long time, but maybe we can um, uh, spend the last few minutes uh, talking a little bit about um, ESG in the public markets and how that um, potentially might have a deeper uh, in, uh, uh, impact on private investors or private investment. So if, if if that uh, if ESG is priced better or uh, you know is is well I guess we started the conversation with what is the price on carbon but I, and that's still up in the air but if that problem can be solved does it help private markets address a lot of these issues? I mean I think it would help right so if everyone were paying attention to the exact same thing um, and and had to. Um, that would effectively, I mean, it wouldn't be the, the marginal cost of carbon, but it, it would effectively move the price closer to the social, the social um, marginal cost. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, yes, that would help. Um, but, but, you know, are there enough investors that, and enough in, in uh, investor capital, is there enough out there to move the needle because they're willing to sacrifice returns in some way in a, in a private market? Right, L LPs aren't always fiduciaries, right? So th they can have a mandate. Tansel? I, I would say yes, because I think, you know, us as venture investors, when we price around in the private markets, we're kind of back solving to what things would be trading at if they went public eventually, right? So for example, just, you know, this quarter, a lot of stocks have been going down. And so we use that when we're negotiating, we're saying, markets you know we had one of the worst months in nasdaq in whatever 10 years here's a, a bigger discount because of what's going on in the public markets so if all of a sudden you know all the clean tech stocks are trading at a very big premium you know not only us i think we'll be comfortable paying higher prices other investors that are not necessarily focused on climate they're going to say you know wow this market's really hot everything's trading up 
I think we need to get more active in the space. And that's kind of what you saw in 2020 and 2021, where you know us historically, we used to be one of the only venture investors at the later stages around the table in, in clean tech. And all of a sudden we're seeing you know, all these hedge funds, private equity funds that do oil and gas, spinning up a clean tech strategy. So I think the more the public markets are receptive to it and the more you trade at a premium, you know, it'll, it'll definitely trickle down uh, into the private markets and, and we've seen it so far. So Josh, do you think that public policy should then focus on the public markets and uh, have have it, as uh, Tansel is saying, have the trickle down effect to VC investment in this space? I think there's a lot to be said for the notion that uh, you know public markets are clearly a very regulated beast to begin with, and that you know the notion of saying that you know one of the goals of public policy is for companies that are publicly traded to have a kind of disclosure, for instance, which goes beyond financial disclosure to impact disclosure and the like, and that there's the full force of you know the uh, the government behind the accuracy and the uh, quality of those disclosures. It seems that's a very hard thing to uh, to argue with, and that you can also imagine that that may indeed have, as was suggested, some trickle down effects to the uh, to the to the private markets. I guess I get a little more nervous in terms of you know right. We've seen lots of examples of governments over the years trying to tell pension funds to invest in this or invest in that. Uh, generally, those have been recipes for disaster in terms of not just simply leading to a negative reaction, but actually, you know, souring the willingness of people to invest, pensions to invest in this area for many years to come. So I guess I like more the, you know, the, the sort of table setting stuff, like encouraging the quality of disclosure and the information available to investors in the public market, than this more, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren style, uh, we're going to tell you exactly what to do with your uh, pension savings and so forth. Jane, your your thoughts on 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 this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the it's the direction that I'm still laughing at the Elizabeth Warren comment. Um, I think it's the the direction that um, that markets are going. I think it will start to to come down. Or you know. We've asked our companies to report on on their ESG performance um, because we're trying to quantify outcomes from Fund One. Um, I think North America is behind on on um, how it gets um, sort of actioned. Um, I'm I'm having a I'm having a a moment, but um, Laura the. Sustainable finance reporting disclosure. Did I get that right? In in the EU, where it's actually being, you know, public companies are being are going to be required to disclose, um, and investors are going to be required to disclose ESG performance. Um, and when that happens, I think that that necessarily impacts um, public markets. But I also think that will start to flow down to private markets and how we look at. At deals, if companies have a hard time accessing public capital um, or large capital because of a lack of sort of as they grow meeting the, the standards of public companies, I think it's it's going to be challenging. So I, I think there's a bit of back and forth flow that'll probably happen there. Great. Uh, so go ahead. Sorry. And of course, the proposed rules from the SEC are already being litigated, right? So. Mm. <laughs> You know, if we um, and and the the European disclosures are still voluntary, right? The double yeah. materiality and things of that nature. But it's coming. Like it's just it's changing. Five years ago, we wouldn't have been having this conversation. It's just it's just changing. Right. So we can only hope that this takes shape, and uh, you know, then that uh, hopefully influences uh, how. Um, we can uh, invest and spur innovation in this area. Um, and, uh, you know, because that's, that's essentially, as Tansel, as you mentioned, that uh, at the end of the day, you're looking for an exit as an investor in the, uh, as, as a VC. And um, the valuations um, are going to drive that. And norms or quantifiable norms, uh, compliance issues in the public markets 
are going to shape that as well. So um, perhaps that might also address what you um, talked about previously as to when you have these uh, companies that um, without actually uh, you know, returning a profit, their valuations are dramatically improving from one round to the next. Uh, uh, and that's not sustainable in the long run. So clearly. Um, any um, last um, thoughts on, um, on our discussion today? Josh, what would you? No, I think this is, I mean, these are important issues. They're not easy answers, but I think we've at least, you know, done our best to grapple with them. And thanks for such an able job of moderating this. <laughs> Thank you. Tansel? I completely agree. I think, you know, this is a mega trend that's here to stay. It's going to happen. I think the question is how fast, but you know, there's more capital. People are 10 times more receptive to it. People care about it. So I think it's going to happen. You know, there's going to be bumps along the road, but you know, I think we'll get there eventually. Great, uh, Jane. Yep, that was that was well said by both. I I I completely agree. You know, the issue is here. I believe it's finally here to stay, which I've been saying for 20 years, but I think it actually is now. Um, and you know we're having the conversation, which is is um, relatively new and relatively important. So thank you for hosting it, and as Josh said, um, thank you for doing such an able job of moderating. Well done. Oh, I had the easy job, <laughs> Laura. <laughs> any last thoughts? Sure. Um, just um, that consumer preferences are, I think, where we should pay attention um, because that will drive uh, in investor preferences. Uh, going forward. And so, yes, the regulators are on it. Um, one can try to be optimistic about that, um, but, but, but time, time, time will tell. But I, I do think that the, the consumer is um, really important here and educating the consumer about where their power comes from is, is, is a step forward as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, today. And thank you, Laura. Thank you, Tansel. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Josh, for this uh, very nice discussion on this topic. Uh, you know, it's hopefully we have a, a, a rosy future to look forward to and uh, things will happen uh, in the near future. Um, thanks uh, also to our audience for joining us uh, in for this session. Uh, please stay tuned for our next session, which is starting at 12.30 p.m., featuring a fireside chat between Dan Sinkovitz of Morgan Stanley and uh, the chair of our Asset Management Council, Perry Trukina. Um, so your same Zoom link will serve uh, as well for that session. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Debarshi. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good rest of the day. Bye.